as I said, it is an important and a landmark in uh, the life and you know the life of Communist Party of China, having reached 100, founded in 1921. So, what better day to discuss this among one of the esteemed scholars of India, in India, from different uh, parts parts of the country, and uh, we I also welcome all the participants here for different universities, institutions, students, as well as faculty members. And and once again, uh, today's discussion will be chaired by Professor Alka Acharya from JNU, uh, and who has been one of the leading scholars in the country. And also, like we have steam uh, speakers from, from uh, Delhi University, JNU, and as well as, uh, you know, uh, Argentina, uh, Dr. Petrio Gusto, good morning to you once again and welcome aboard. And uh, before, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, throw the, uh, let, set the ball rolling, I would ask uh, Professor uh, 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 Swan to the head of the department to welcome all the uh, participants and the speakers uh, for this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you so much, Beam. Uh, it is uh, uh, our immense pleasure, uh, my personal pleasure, as well as uh, on behalf of the Department of Political Science at the University of Hyderabad to welcome uh, the distinguished panelists uh, today, Professor Alka Acharya, who would be chairing uh, the uh, panel discussion on Chinese Communist uh, Party on its centenary. Uh, we have five very distinguished uh, uh, panelists, Professor Manoranjan Mohanty, formerly of the Delhi University, Dr. Hemant Adlakha from uh, Zawahalar Nehru University, Dr. Zebin Jacob from uh, the Sif Nadar University, Dr. Sri Parna Pathak from the OP Zindal uh, Global uh, University, and uh, Patricio Giosto from the uh, uh, Pontifical uh, uh, university at uh, Argentina in Argentina, so we uh, like we would extend a uh, most well uh, a heartiest welcome to each of these distinguished panelists, to my distinguished uh, uh, to the distinguished faculties and colleagues uh, of the Department of Political Science here in University of Hyderabad, as well as from other universities, uh, from Guwahati, from uh, Saint Mary's College Shillong, from you know, other universities in different parts of India, and also from uh, students and scholars, not only of the department, but also of the university and other colleges and universities in different parts of India for showing your keen interest in this very, uh, very pertinent as well as interesting uh, topic of panel discussion today. Uh, I, I hope uh, the distinguished uh, panelists would show significant light uh, on our uh, understanding of the complex nuance and challenges that uh, the Communist Party of China has grappled with over time. And we hope that uh, it would be a good learning experience. And with these uh, very few words, uh, let me again extend our heartiest as well as warm welcome to each and every one of you and looking forward to a very fruitful uh, panel discussion ahead. So. It's over to you, Professor Alka, for the rest of the uh, uh, session. Thank you once again for making it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and a very, very good afternoon to all of you here. Um, it is a pleasure, no doubt, but an honor, really, to be asked to chair this. Uh, uh, the, the panelists are all uh, very, very good scholars, and particularly uh, Professor Monti, our guru, our teacher, and I think uh, possibly uh, the leading figure expert uh, on Chinese politics and the Chinese Communist Party in the country today. Uh, in fact, that's why I was very glad that uh, Beam did not ask him to chair. Normally, you just go and uh, ask the senior most person to chair. I said, no, no, he shouldn't be chairing. <laughs> he should be enlightening us. So I'm very glad that he is... Uh, uh, he is the lead speaker here today, and uh, the others. Now, Beam had sent me um, the, the, the CVs of all the speakers, and it has been circulated. So, Beam, 
uh, I really will not go into uh, giving everybody a background uh, about the speakers. It will take too much time and neither will I spend any uh, time um, pontificating on this matter. Uh, I think uh, the edification has to come from the presentations here. Uh, my job, um, you have very clearly and cleverly ensured that I will keep quiet and just regulate the proceedings. Uh, so I will, I, I will do that. But uh, let me just uh, individually welcome uh, Professor Monty, uh, Dr. Hemant Adlatha, uh, Jabin Sriparna, and uh, Patricio Gristo. I hope I have pronounced your name right. Uh, so, uh, thank you all very much for being a part of this very important panel. Uh, one of my students in the morning had sent me a photograph uh, of the ceremonies that are taking place in Beijing, and uh, there's one photograph that I found really quite, quite, quite uh, interesting was uh, Xi Jinping dressed in a Mao suit. Uh, and he was asking me whether I had ever seen that uh, uh, Xi Jinping in a Mao, and I, do, I, I, could, I couldn't remember whether I had, maybe he had worn it in his early days, but I think um, this this current picture, today's picture of him in a Mao suit was quite uh, quite interesting. In fact, um, it, it, it really um, jolted me a bit because from afar it almost looked like it was, you know, a Mao standing there, right? But uh, the point here is that uh, this is a very, very important occasion. Uh, in uh, in the history of any institution, uh, completing a hundred years uh, is not just about completing so many. I mean, completing a milestone and and, and reaching a centenary. Uh, it's also about uh, what has transpired in this uh, in this long century, uh, which has uh, thrown up on many occasions uh, prognostications about. Uh, coming collapse, the cracking up of China, the problems that uh, the CPC is facing, the internal challenges. And what we are seeing is a party that appears to be stronger than ever, uh, or resilient, uh, exercising a great deal of uh, loyalty and uh, even fascination among its peoples. Um, so, so the the important questions that are thrown up uh, by this this facts these facts are are what we need to understand and i think more than ever now it is necessary to start focusing on what is the nature of this party and why it is enduring uh, despite the fact that uh, there are so many challenges uh, that it appears to be facing so uh, with those few words i am going to now uh, request professor mohanty to open the proceedings um, I'm not too sure about the time each uh, speaker will be having. Beam, uh, how much time do we give each of the speakers? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, fine. Yes. So, uh, so, Professor Mohanty, uh, please uh, let us uh, be edified and uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, at uh, 12 minutes, uh, let me know, please. Okay. Okay. And um, uh, you know, 2015, when they were celebrating the 70th anniversary in a military parade of the victory uh, over the anti-Japanese war, uh, Xi Jinping was also in the Mao suit. Then in a okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm very happy about this occasion. Um, for my very personal and institutional reason that the initiative uh, for this seminar was taken by him, Subba, and Sombya Nayak. Uh, I don't want to say third or fourth generation, my students, students, <laughs> and so on, uh, but uh, uh, people with whom I have partnered uh, projects and writings, and uh, uh, therefore uh, I'm very, very happy. And who are doing the kind of Chinese studies, social science, language, theory, comparative analysis altogether. Uh, 
uh, you know, that kind of expertise. So I'm, I'm very happy about this initiative. Now, um, again, Bhim referred to the celebrations. Uh, I tried, uh, I saw bits and pieces because we don't get uh, CGTN on Tata Sky. And, uh, but I did read the reports and speeches, the speech of uh, at least the main excerpts from Xi Jinping's speech. And uh, uh, look, for me, this last two years, particularly since uh, um, January, uh, 2020, it has been uh, a period of reflection and uh, self-criticism uh, because of the COVID context about how we have understood the world, our development strategies, our global perspectives, our lifestyles. Uh, therefore, if I don't see people uh, uh, having a sense of modesty and humility about history of human civilization and their own country, country's achievements, no matter how well they have tackled COVID, uh, one victory, another victory, prematurely declared and so on, uh, I, feel, I feel uneasy. Uh, therefore, on the one hand, I was enjoying the celebrations, uh, and uh, the main theme of 100 years, as Xi Jinping put it, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Am I listening to Xi Jinping or some familiar name from Indian freedom struggle? Not Gandhi Ambedkar. I will not mention. The, uh, so, uh, the, uh, therefore, uh, Yes, great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. That is the Chinese dream. That has been Xi Jinping's uh, signature uh, slogan. Uh, uh, I was uh, I was waiting to see whether uh, there is a uh, willingness to learn from hundred years. Uh, maybe this is not the occasion today, and the uh, sixth plenum or whichever plenum comes next before the 20th Party Congress or the 20th Party Congress next year. I hope Bhim takes the initiative uh, to do a volume on that. Uh, I will leave it to ICS and you, all of you uh, because I have declared I'm not available for that. The, uh, so the 20th Congress may have that uh, uh, reflection. Uh, and and uh, so the... Um, um, and they, they had declared victory over uh, one phase of history, namely one revolution centenary celebrated, the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and uh, the definition of the success is the success achieved in uh, achieving a moderately prosperous uh, I mean, well-off society in all respects, Chao And uh, and that is further defined as uh, abolition of absolute poverty. Certainly, this is a great achievement. All of us recognize it and we appreciate this great achievement of China's reforms, particularly, uh, and many other achievements. Uh, but. Uh, uh, as uh, Xi Jinping talks about the original aspiration, the founding mission, last three to four months, uh, and he has said that he has visited all the heritage sites of Chinese Communist Party and its evolution and movement uh, of the Chinese Revolution, particularly during the last uh, nine years that he has been in charge. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, culmination of that process was uh, leading the study group of the Politburo to Peita, to Peking University campus, to the Red Building, about which uh, I was mentioning earlier in the conversation. So, uh, what was the original vision? What was the original aspiration? Uh, uh, was it uh, 
only abolition of poverty or it has to do with socialism it has to do with reducing inequalities uh, today i was rereading uh, a, an edited book of mine which is not probably known to many people chinese revolution comparative perspectives uh, ajanta publication i wrote an essay called uh, chinese revolution reconsiderations in revolutionary theory 1992 my goodness uh, i uh, i find those reconsiderations of the communist party and the chinese revolution have been further vindicated this 30 years later and uh, that was a un un project that five country scholars had done anyway so uh, and the four uh, lessons from the 100 years that xi jinping i'll briefly mention uh, mentions are a successful completion of the people's democratic revolution a successful completion of socialist construction socialist transition and socialist construction socialist transformation and socialist construction you know that's how 56 58 period was defined 1956 58 then uh, successful achievements successes achieved in uh, reforms open door and modernization and the fourth lesson is the current uh, continuing successes continuing achieving achievement of successes in building socialism with chinese characteristics in the new era only the that is practicing xi jinping thought he didn't mention that of course but uh, so socialist socialism with chinese characteristics in the new era that is china's rise uh, as a global power uh, and the new achievements uh, whether it is reaching the mars whether it is uh, commissioning the world's largest hydro electric generation uh, you know set in uh, southwest china or whatever and of course many other economic successes i will raise three questions which scholars i i know not many people are now engaged in party history it's my complaint to anchung madhavi and kamal shir the historians of our group and i hope uh, you people uh, who are in the new leadership positions will look after this um that uh, how do we study chinese history and send to present and particularly modern history since for open so uh, i have three questions uh, very very ordinary mundane questions but they trouble me a lot uh, in Uh, at this time because the cpc is only 20 years older than me okay <laughs> so um, socialism in the 21st century what are its what are what are socialism's new challenges uh, you know first decade of 20th 21st century we discussed it then we have forgotten now the climate change crisis and now the covid crisis has regenerated those those questions and the other day david harvey was speaking up and uh, one day one day jones book we were discussing in the south south forum uh, we raised these questions uh, the environmental question the gender question the ethnic question the cultural question the democracy at every level participation at every level so what is this notion of people if it is not translated into uh, participation of concrete human beings in their units and in their territorial units and professional and organizational units at every level so end of alienation and foundation of freedom that was the marxist aim of socialism okay freedom of each as the precondition for freedom of all says communist manifesto okay so what is that charter of freedom uh, in the chinese uh, communist party centenary discourse 
or in the hundred odd Xi Jinping thought study centers in universities of China. Okay, that's one. Because these questions were raised in the Chinese history of the Chinese Communist Party from time to time. During the Yan'an period, the gender question and the culture question and the democracy question and the party army relationship. Party army relationship is being discussed in one way or the other and parties command over the army. Even though still armed power is the basis of the socialist state rather than people's power. This is my still judgment because 91 million or they have a new report saying 95 million members uh, are still not the 1.4 billion Chinese population. Okay, and uh, so you need democratic institutional practices, and therefore these inner party debates. In that essay, I discussed the 45 history resolution. Some questions concerning our party. The, the 81 resolution, some questions on the history of the party where Mao Zedong was assessed and again 70% correct, 30% wrong. The same method that Mao applied to Stalin was applied. Okay, that's the first question. Uh, I, I mean, I hope... Manu, we've reached 12 minutes, so... Okay. So, so the other two, other two questions are uh, very easy for you to guess. One is capitalism in 21st century in the high-tech AI states, I call it silicon capitalism, the artificial intelligence states. China braved and achieved the superiority in this. So from manufacture to services to finance to high-tech to artificial intelligence. Is, and so is Chinese Communist Party achieving a capitalist society with a Communist Party controlling power? or a different society? That is my question. And this question was raised in the history of the international communist movement all over the world and in China. And when Tagore was criticized by some communists in China in his time, in, during his visits, uh, they also raised these questions. But Tagore had an answer and some Indian communists have now recently discussed Tagore in a different context, the importance of that. And finally, Human civilization in the 21st century. You know, the BRI, I hope, is understood as respecting multiple civilizations existing in all parts of the world. But I have a feeling that the Confucius Institutes and the BRI together, they have a mission of publicizing about the superiority of the Chinese civilization. Sorry. The UN program of dialogue of civilizations to which China is a part is my reference point. The world is full of many great civilizations, even territorially small, culturally small, but historically and civilizationally. And this was the theme of the new culture movement and its challenge. And but what we see today, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, nationalism driving the definition of civilizational perspective. And therefore, this centenary celebration has to be cast from a vantage point of a civilizational crisis that COVID has forced us to reckon with. And therefore, while I send my greetings and best wishes to my many friends, and I share the glory of the Chinese revolution and its successes even today. I raise these questions because this is the best tribute to the original aspiration of the founders of the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks Manu. I think as you said very rightly, simple questions, but extremely, extremely complex and profound and our attempts to try and find uh, their answers. But uh, I agree completely that these have to be raised because uh, where are these questions in the debates in the Communist Party? I, I think the, the 
focus has become so much on just achieving the dream which has been quantified literally uh, that these fundamental issues uh, which are uh, which are central to the to the to, to to the existence of the communist party are seem seem to be on uh, put aside so yes thank you very much for those questions i will now turn to uh, himant uh, please uh, are you able to hear unmute yourself himant please and uh, let us listen to your presentation yes um, thank you alka um, am i audible am i yes you are go ahead okay um, um thank you alka uh, and i must apologize in the beginning because i am facing some connectivity issues so if if my connection snaps off in between somebody will have to maybe point it out and then i'll do something about it anyway um uh, professor uh, suan and bhim and somya um professor mohanty and my dear colleagues uh, i'm very happy to be part of this event which i will not uh, talk about the organizational part of this because already enough has been said by bhim and others let me straight away come to my topic which is cpc at 100 uh, young china is re embracing mao um, um i mean let me try and pick up uh, from where professor monty left off um, he talked about new issues in the study of the cpc history uh and also uh, he he talked about how some of the issues which he had already uh, flagged or pointed out in his uh, uh, essay which he mentioned a little while ago in 1992 have been vindicated uh, um, to a large extent even after 30 years of his writing those points so uh, uh, my my presentation brief presentation today perhaps will uh, uh shuttle between or uh, discuss some of the points which alka had raised in her article which appeared in the hindu today of how the cpc endures and also some of the issues which have been now uh, raised by professor mohanty but um, my presentation would be slightly different in the sense that i would be talking about uh, issues like what is socialism what is chinese socialism marxism leninism mao zedong thought etc etc by reflecting on how chinese are discussing this rather than uh, giving um, uh, points of view or debates happening outside china or uh, how we look at it i would briefly touch upon how the issues are being debated and discussed within china and that is why the title uh, actually it is china is re embracing mao and young is a prefix which makes it uh, parenthesis and which makes it young china is re embracing mao uh, <clears throat> now very quickly uh, i'll just read out couple of paragraphs from the prepared text uh, which i did hurriedly for this event today i mean the chinese historians uh, are engaged in very serious discussions uh, of late on how the present day uh, party establishment or party uh, understanding that is chinese communist party's understanding uh, uh, is is about or of the legacy of the chinese revolution and the chinese communist party and especially a lot of young historians are engaged in this exercise there heated debates going on in china and which are easily available accessible on the internet by anybody uh, and the chinese historians are undertaking this this task with twin purposes one in order to understand the current trends among the country's youths who are re-embracing mao and socialism and second at the same time uh, to help the younger generation of china to better understand the past in a more objective and positive light 
Now let me quickly decipher the meaning of what do the Chinese people mean when they say that the outside world does not fully understand today's China or fails to comprehend the spirit and significance of the Communist Party rule in China today. And since there is a time limit, so I might have to skip uh, uh, paragraphs from here and there. So please uh, bear with me for that. Now, uh, I mean, I would just briefly uh, reply these two questions which Chinese are always asking that why is it that the Communist Party rule in China has been now projected or painted as villainous, especially in the light of what has been happening in the past one year or since the COVID started. Now, <clears throat> Chinese tell us, Chinese people tell us that the outside world perhaps does not understand the very tenet or the very reason why the Chinese Communist Party was born. And the Chinese Communist Party was born for, to launch a struggle to bring about a change in China, a change which was not seen in China's 3,000 year old history. That is one. And second, what is the meaning of Communist Party rule today, 100 years after the party was born and the party successfully brought about a revolution in China? That change it brought about for which it was founded in 1921. And today's Communist Party rule, they say, stands for helping the people of China to fight against the attitudes of the outside world which have not changed in the last 100 years. And the best example of that is uh, what we read, uh, read about or what we heard, uh, especially throughout the last year, uh, that the Western countries, especially uh, the US imperialism, even stopped addressing China as PRC and Xi Jinping as president of China. And they straight away started referring to China as the Communist Party ruled country and uh, Xi Jinping as the Communist Party <coughs> ruler. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to a sentence which has been mentioned in the uh, flyer of the event which was circulated by Bhim. Uh, under the title about about the discussion and in that about the discussion there is one sentence which reads and I quote that the survivor and longevity of the communist rule have witnessed domestic turbulences and external challenges. For the specific purpose of my presentation today I would like to make a very small change in that sentence and I would add or alter that sentence as saying that the external challenges are still being witnessed and confronted. It's not over yet. So that is the thrust of my presentation today. Remember, and the, that external threat in the most prominent and visible form comes from the US imperialism. And this is first time in 40 years today that the officially, officially the Chinese Communist Party actually is using this terminology by calling US as US imperialism, which they haven't used in the past 40 years. So, so that is a context in which I am discussing the Communist Party attaining 100 years uh, today. And, and um, I mean, for, uh, to just continue to emphasize on how the Communist Party is being perceived outside China or by the outside forces, and uh, for example, falling just short of mentioning regime change, uh, first Trump and now Biden have been relentlessly provocative in urging the Chinese people to work with the US to bring about a change in the direction of the ruling Chinese Communist Party. And all the 14 vice chairpersons of the standing committee of the 13th NPC continue to be banned since December last year. So that is the context. So in that context, as he why Chinese people, especially the younger generation, especially the generation Z or millennials, are looking back 
to ideas of Marxism, Leninism, Socialism, Mao Zedong thought and re-embracing them. A popular social media platform in China recently asked, who is the greatest figure in modern Chinese history? The Chinese historians and academics, as usual, were typically confused and miserably failed to arrive at a consensus. They wandered from, from um, Sun Yat-sen to Lu Xun to Chiang Kai-shek to Mao Zedong to Tang Xiaoping, even uh, Hu Shi and Chao Lai, among others. However, 95% general respondents, they picked up Chairman Mao as their answer. Now, according to young Shanghai historian Wang Rui, to anyone outside China, it might seem a reasonable answer coming from the Chinese people whom Mao helped liberate. But Wang Rui surprises us by observing that such high degree of consensus on Mao's name would have been impossible to imagine until a few years ago. So what, I, what new has happened in the just few years? Or what has changed in recent years? And that is where I take upon or I uh, take from Professor Monti's point of what is socialism or what is socialism in China, which Alka also talked about in her article about cynicization of Marxism. So, so today's generation is fiercely discussing the cynicization of Marxism in China according to the period of their history and the leaders leading the Communist Party. We have a first phase which brought about the Chinese Revolution. Then we have the signification of Tang style. And then why, now we have signification of Xi Jinping style. And I think it is this which is uh, making the ch younger generation uh, uh, perhaps fed up with the textbook or classroom uh, style imposing of views and they are looking elsewhere. So this debate is happening within China that do we really need to go on like a permanent revolution with permanent signification of Marxism Leninism in China? This is the question uh, young people in China are asking. Two more minutes, Hemant, please. Oh, okay. I, I've just begun actually. <laughs> okay, so I'll just skip everything and leave it for the question answer session and uh, just give a quick example of, for example, last week there was a huge controversy among historians when one particular historian from Shanghai uh, wrote about uh, the Cultural Revolution legacy and used a particular expression which, which meant that Cultural Revolution brought disaster for China. And that created a huge controversy, especially on the uh, social media, Weibo, etc., and also in universities and classroom discussions in China. Because uh, this was something which is not even uh, the phraseology, which is not even part of the 1981 resolution on CPC history. Uh, th there it was uh, a, a mistake or something like that, not disaster. So those people started asking this question that uh, where is this kind of phraseology or terminology coming from? So in the debate, an alternative point of view which emerged was that today's Chinese generation is actually willing to ignore the extremes or the excesses of the Mao era and go back to the egalitarian model rather than embrace or rather than quietly accept the 996 model, which is actually Jack Ma's model and Jack Ma type of socialism they are rejecting. So I think I'll stop here and face uh, question answers during the session. Thank you. Thanks. I really feel sorry to cut off uh, the speakers just as they start to warm up. And I think, Hemant, your uh, presentation has brought out, I think, two or three very fascinating uh, kind of facets. Uh, there's one which is really about uh, how the Chinese appear to be very uh, much on the defensive against the kind of criticism that is coming out. And uh, this uh, reaction to the perceived kind of... Uh, um, uh, literally insulting way in which the leadership or, or the, the, the Chinese system is being uh, discussed. 
and that's really provoking the kind of backlash on the one hand. But the other very fascinating aspect that you brought out is that there is a degree of questioning. I mean, Manu said that where is the questioning? I think the questioning, Manu, ha seems to be, according to what Hemant is uh, trying to unfold, it seems to be happening at the level of the people. That there is a certain rejection of the kind of egalitarian society that China has become. Uh, there appears to be uh, a desire to go back to some of these more fundamental issues about uh, what does it mean to have uh, uh, the Communist Party as a people's party? I mean, is it any more a people's party? And so, so I think this questioning has begun. And um, Hemant has tantalizingly opened that space up to us. Uh, hopefully, we shall hear more of that. But I now turn to my third speaker, Javin Jacob. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me begin uh, by... Uh, complimenting the Department of Political Science at the University of Hyderabad for organizing this event. I think we have far too many events on India-China border, geopolitics and the like, and not enough about uh, matters internal to China, because without this really we cannot understand uh, what we need to do in terms of India-China relations as well. I'm just going to briefly, Jabin, uh, um, Jabin, I'm just going to briefly interrupt. Dean uh, uh, has already uh, asked the attendees to start typing in their questions. So I will request everybody who has questions uh, to put them in the chat box so that it will be easier for us to negotiate the kind of uh, issues that are raised. Uh, the chat box question. Yes, Jevin, sorry, continue. So, um, as I was saying, without understanding China's domestic issues, there's no way we are going to get our foreign policy towards China right. Uh, I also want to um, sort of underline the fact that, you know, despite the pomp on show, despite all the references that were made to, you know, China's growth, uh, China's development, uh, and the sort of jazz that we see around. Uh, let's be aware, let's be very careful uh, to note that this is all, I mean, I mean, this is pomp and show. Uh, the edifice uh, is actually based on very shaky foundations. And I think uh, we should uh, constantly be interrogating the picture that we see from uh, China uh, and uh, what the Chinese themselves present to us. Now, what I'm going to try and do is uh, try something new here. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, broadly my topic is parties, economy, and I'm trying to look at how uh, uh, the economic uh, issues are being discussed, are being addressed in terms of uh, what is happening inside China. I think uh, quite a few people have their mics on, on uh, unmuted, so if I could request the others to please mute their mics. Or Beam could probably mute everybody, uh, you know, himself because he's got the authority. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, to start with, let's look at the problems in the Chinese economy, right? Uh, there's ri rising regional disparities, growing in income inequalities, environmental degradation, inefficiencies in state-owned enterprises, lack of consumer confidence, uh, capitalists fleeing abroad, employment rates are declining. So despite all this talk about poverty alleviation and China having arrived at a moderately prosperous, uh, you know, all of this is party propaganda. Uh, the reality can be quite different. Certainly, uh, China is far more advanced uh, in terms of its economic and development indicators than India is. So there's nothing for us to crow about that China has these weaknesses. But what we need to understand as students of Chinese politics or Chinese uh, economy, as well as you know, general observers of what's going on in China, is that uh, these realities are also equally true. Now, what uh, I have before you is a sort of a idea in the making. I am trying to look at how economic discourse in China is, uh, you know, is taking shape and how it is taking shape in, in an in a, in a environment where Xi Jinping appears to be centralizing power. Uh, so one framework I have is really of factionalism. I mean, we are all aware of political factions in China. You know, you have the Shanghai faction, or you have the CYL, the Communist Youth League faction, 
and factions have been a regular uh, in, uh, uh, instrument to study Chinese politics. But uh, and you know they are usually identified by location, by you know work type, or you know whatever uh, relationship you have with the top guy, whatever his uh, position is. But very seldom has uh, uh, the idea of factionalism been considered from an economic point of view. Whereas in history, if you look at it, most of the great conflicts in China within the Communist Party have actually had economic reasons. If you look at the, uh, uh, the Great Leap Forward and the fall of Meng Zhuhai, uh, essentially it was uh, uh, you know, criticism of Mao in the wake of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, which Mao turned to a political fight. Uh, you know, he called him a, a rightist and so on. But, uh, you know, Peng Zohai, Liu Shuaqi, Zhao Enlai, Tang Xiaoping, they've all clashed with Mao and been sidelined with Mao because of primarily their views on what the economic conditions in China were and what the responses, what the, uh, the proper responses to those crises were. Uh, and, you know, we've it is actually quite easy to turn the economic difficult uh, uh, sort of obtruse uh, issues of economy into political uh, factions because that's easy. It's easier, it's black and white, and everybody seems to be uh, able to understand, oh, somebody's against Chairman Mao, therefore uh, that person is bad, not looking at exactly what the reasons for the conflict or the opposition were. Now, uh, I would argue that despite Xi Jinping's uh, strong position today in China, he will be constrained for multiple reasons to allow a certain de degree of plurality of economic thinking, uh, economic thought, uh, because ultimately the, for the party, you know, all its goals are economy related. Uh, even though they build political capital on this, they, they build this political capital on the basis of economic achievement. And running the economy is not some, so easy, especially a complex beast that the Chinese economy is today, right? So to start with, what are uh, these economic policies? What is, in, in a sense, what is Xi's economic philosophy? Does such a thing exist of itself? Or is it derived primarily from a political ideology or understanding? Now, Xi, given that he's a political leader and he spent his career as a party apparatchik, it, it is reasonable to suppose that his economic policies they are derived out of political interests rather than the other way around. And one must suppose that this is largely the case for all CPC members because preservation of the party in power is first and primary. Now, the logical follow-up uh, would be that if all members of the CPC are devoted to keeping the party in power, then the differences uh, in the direction or the nature of economic policies are the result of differences in what they see as the most effective way of keeping that party in power. Now, in, uh, in his report to the 19th Party Congress, Xi Jinping himself uh, redefined the principal contradiction for the CPC as a contradiction between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing need for a better life. This is an economic statement. Uh, in, in the party report, in fact, there's a whole section called Applying a New Vision of Development and Developing a Modernized Economy. So, uh, unlike political leaders elsewhere who sort of leave the economics or the economy to the experts uh, because they don't necessarily see political capital out of it. Here is a leader, uh, despite perhaps uh, he's not, uh, the fact that he's not really uh, well versed in economic issues, who is constrained to refer to the economy, to come up with ideas on the economy because the economy is front and center for the Communist Party. Remember in uh, December 2018, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the reforms and opening up, uh, this she made a very important speech. Now he made, uh, the, and you get a sense of his political or economic direction, when you note that he made uh, reference to Tung Xiaoping about seven times, uh, Mao Zedong five times. But in general, Tung Xiaoping was not so prominent, despite being the progenitor of these reforms. It was Karl Marx who was mentioned 12 times and Marxism or Marxism-Leninism, you know, uh, occurred about a dozen times uh, together. So, uh, and even when, even the number of references to Mao were limited, they were fairly consequential. I mean, Xi Jinping has never criticized Mao ever since he took over, right? Uh, and uh, this has been amplified in party documents or party journals, for example, Xiu Xiu. 
you know, in which uh, in in 2020, in uh, in, in July uh, 2020, uh, you know, it published an excerpt of Xi's speeches, and uh, you know, altogether there was just one reference to Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Tung Shopping theory, etc. But uh, he he tried to promote uh, the idea. The, pre, uh, the focus is on thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. So here Xi Jinping again trying to promote an economic model that he thinks has a stamp on it. Now, to Xi's line of thinking, uh, clearly China's domestic weaknesses require a stronger hand of the state. And this is what we've been seeing over the last few years, that despite the, uh, the decision of the third plenum, uh, you know, where we said that we would give uh, market uh, the, the decisive role in allocating resources, he's walked back substantially from it. And his China dream, you know, the China dream is essentially what is the uh, lingo at home and Chinese wisdom is, uh, so is what is advertised uh, for the rest of the world. This Chinese dream or Chinese wisdom uh, is about going beyond the Singapore model. I mean, it's very clear while we have always looked at China as an expanded model of the Singapore model, you know, where economic laissez-faire or economic freedom and strong state control, uh, Xi Jinping wants to go beyond the Singapore model. Singapore is, after all, a very westernized society. He wants to maintain a Chinese system with Chinese characteristics, not Western. And uh, one way that he's identified uh, doing this is by retaining strong political control strong political command over the economy, unlike uh, in Singapore or unlike in any other Western system. And, you know, I, I might uh, sort of uh, ask you all to sort of reflect on how the Indian economy itself is being run. You know, where are the, uh, the political levers, the political control that is being exercised on different institutions and the uh, branches of the Indian economy? In, in many ways, I think there's a case here for comparison between India and China. Now, of course, uh, she is not without competition. You know, what are these competing economic and political views uh, or frameworks to cheese? The competition is essentially, uh, of course, the result of the legacy that Tung Shopping left behind. You know, you try multiple things at the same time. You try multiple things in different areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, essentially, you therefore create opportunities for efficiencies arising from different models. And you see which works. Uh, rather than take a hard and fast a priori uh, position on what will work or what is going to uh, be best for the Communist Party. Now, uh, if you look at how Xi Jinping has, I mean, one way to understand what the competition is or what Xi Jinping is, wor Xi, Xi Jinping is worried about is to look at how he's targeted uh, individuals, economists, or uh, economic institutions. Uh, for example, he's arrested Ren Chao Chia. Uh, he's a princeling. He's a part, member of the party elite, uh, a real estate tycoon, but, uh, and he's had very strong views on how the Chinese economy was being run under Xi Jinping. He's been arrested. Among intellectuals, uh, Xu Changrun uh, was arrested. You know, in, in, in February 2020, in fact, Xu uh, directly accused Xi Jinping and those around him of being responsible for the uh, mishandling of the coronavirus outbreak, of course. But so he also referred to yeah, he also referred to the princelings as good for nothing, unable to achieve anything, uh, but capable of still ruining China. Xi Jinping also shut down in 2018 the Unirul Institute of Economics in Beijing, you know, which for a long time had actually not been talking so much about political liberalization or sticking to only economic issues. But even this was too much for um, uh, Xi Jinping to handle. Both Ren and Xu have specifically referred cons uh, uh, regularly to uh, the problems in the Chinese economy. Uh, in their criticism, in their political criticism. And uh, Xu, in fact, has specifically talked about the, uh, referred to the competence of the technocratic system and the fact that this has been sidelined. This could be a case of uh, the reference to Li Keqiang being sidelined from the uh, political decision or economic decision making. Remember, uh, most PhDs in, in China, unlike those in India, are, I mean, of, of political leaders, is just party PhDs. Huh? You know, they're not serious PhD. But Li Keqiang is one with a genuine PhD in economics. But he is the guy who's not in charge of the economy. It's Xi Jinping who leads the uh, leading small group for comprehensively deepening reform, leading small group for financial and economic affairs. 
now economic decisions are not the purview so much of the state council as these leading small groups which are party bodies with xi jinping at the top and li keqiang only a deputy um in 2018 again uh, the peking university professor zhang weiying specifically criticized the china model he said that china is frightening away the west and uh, this would this china model will actually lead to a conf inevitable confrontation between china and the west he argued that rather than any chinese exceptionalism or chinese characteristics it was precisely the fact that china was following a universal model that was responsible for its success and so this is something that i think we also need to look at when you know uh, compared to what professor monty was talking maybe china isn't so unique and uh, china is unique only in terms of its uh, political uh, model but if uh, the kind of economic uh, reforms or results that is achieved is probably achieved like everybody else is being doing and therefore he says uh, professor chang blindly emphasizing the china model would lead us onto a path of strengthening state owned enterprises expansion of state power and overly relying on industrial policy if you notice you really cannot keep out the economic uh, issues uh, from the political i mean economic issues will in inevitably lead to the political they are all connected and this is precisely why xi jinping has been proactive in shutting down uh, you know private economic uh, enterprise in a sense of a uh, private economic thought rather than private economic enterprise i'm sorry but he's targeted the big guys he's targeted jack ma he shut down bitcoin mining he's clearly targeted the china tech sector uh, he's tightened regulations on fintech uh, up you are uh, exceeding your time to i have to all right give me give me 30 seconds uh, if i have to say something new i'll have to say i exceed time by just a little bit so now the the catch final final point anyway you know uh, the final issue is whether china can proceed in this fashion without uh, you know i mean xi jinping wants red and expert is back to the maoist formulation of red and expert but how is china going to be red and expert in a increasingly integrated global uh, chinese with an in increasingly integrated chinese global economy a globalized economy and i think that really is a question that xi and his minions uh, are dealing with and therefore i think going forward where and how do we look for uh, issues uh, of chinese discourse chinese debates we might have to look closely at these uh, institutions such as the liangwe the national people's congress the cppcc which are often seen as rubber stamp but these are possibly spaces where some debate is likely to take place um, we'll have to look closer at how chinese intellectuals navigate the centralized politically increasingly authoritarian space and how they might switch from political issues to economic issues because after all you i mean the economy is like i said front and center for the uh, party and the party cannot necessarily completely shut down economic debate so yeah let me stop with that thank you so much and forgive me for exceeding the time no 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 forgive me for having to throttle you as it were in full flow i mean <laughs> that was Uh, that was well, well, but that unfortunately uh, we need to uh, have because already in the chat box there are many questions and uh, there are some hands also and I think we are raising issues which are likely to generate a lot of debate. So just try and keep the expansion of one's points uh, to the Q and A. Uh, but uh, thanks, Jabin, for I think uh, there's a very useful kind of an element you brought here. I mean, Xi Jinping going back to Mao and this whole. question of the relationship between economics and politics uh, what is the politics in the economy and what is the economy in politics uh, i think uh, you know if we, we we need to understand this in a very very dialectical sense almost and somewhere uh, what you have spoken about is just is just new wine in old bottles i mean you referred to the fact that the mao and konte why uh, confrontation took and then you come to the mao and liu shaoji and the two parts you know the two lines of the struggles over the two lines of development and then you come to the post cultural so in other words we often try to say that tang comes around and makes this broad consensus but even so this consensus about reforms has not been a uniformity of views on reforms the consensus always was and and we see tang fighting it all the while in fact he had to go in 1992 and just um throw it open saying that we have to just focus again on growth so 
I think there are very interesting uh, lessons to be learned from this uh, economics and politics tussle over the years. And uh, uh, Xi Jinping, in this red and expert kind of a um, combination, is actually seeking to exercise the primacy of politics. But I'll just leave it at that and ask Sri Parna to come in and uh, make her presentation. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Professor Swan, uh, Dr. Subba, and Soumya for having me on board. Um, without taking much time, I'll quickly delve into my topic. And I'm going to talk about um, the Chinese dream and poverty elimination. I'm basically going to assess how far this has been achieved, even though uh, you know that the, the declaration has already been made that um, poverty, absolute poverty, has been um, eradicated. Um, Xi Jinping, he had vowed to leave no one behind. And this year in February, he declared victory in his anti-poverty campaign, which focused on 5 million people. Um, the question is, why is poverty alleviation so important for Xi Jinping and for the CCP and so on? Um, this question of poverty alleviation is very closely connected to the China dream. And in the China dream, we see this um, constant harping on revival of China's glorious history. Um, this has been something which is at the center of Xi Jinping's plan for the country. He, this, this finds repeated mentions in the China dream also. In fact, Xi Jinping even praised CCP today for lifting China out of poverty and humiliation. So poverty alleviation becomes very important. How is this connected to the dream? Um, well, according to Xi Jinping, this the China dream consists of largely three components. The first is a powerful and a rich state. The second is the renewal of the nation. And the third is the happiness of the people. In order to have a powerful and rich state to ensure the happiness of the people, to rejuvenate the nation, China therefore identified poverty, unemployment, and growth, amongst others, as the ills which have to be eradicated primarily before the country celebrates its centennial anniversary. Um, <clears throat> The first centennial goal is very important for the realization of the dream. Um, this moderately prosperous society has to be um, built, um, and therefore uh, poverty had to be wiped out by the year 2021. Um, the building of this moderately prosperous society, it entails the doubling of the 2010 GDP per capita income by 2020. Um, and for this, the CCP fleshed out um, these economic principles by um, talking about completion of a set of projects which range from attaining a 60% urbanization rate, becoming an internet power, transitioning to clean energy, etc. Economics forms a very integral part of this China dream, be it in the form of the revival of the rich, um, be it establishing a powerful nation, um, or finding happiness and economic prosperity for the Chinese citizens, or in the eradication of poverty. This dream has great implications for China's economic future. Um, China definitely has made, uh, you know, a lot of strides and as Jebin calls them, uh, you know, the, the pomp, we need to look beyond the pomp, but, uh, be be before we look beyond the pomp, what has actually been done by China is that it's, it's actually, um, lifted 800 million, uh, people, uh, out of poverty, accounting for 70% of those brought out of, uh, poverty worldwide. China has been the first developing country to meet the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it has reduced population living in poverty by half, and this is ahead of the 2015 schedule. What exactly is poverty in China, therefore? If it's been so successful, it's, it's removed so many people, it's, it's, it's lifted so many people out of poverty. What exactly is poverty? Poverty in China refers to poor inhabitants in rural areas, with urban poverty largely reduced. China's poverty rates fell from 88% in 1981 to 0.7% in 2015. Um, and this was this is at a measurement of um, 1.90 US dollars per day. Um, at the end of 2018, before the pandemic broke out, the number of people living below China's national poverty line, which is 20, which was 2300 yuan per year, was 16.6 million, which translated into 1.7% of the total population. Therefore, China's goal was to raise the poverty line to an annual income of $4,000 by 2020. So in order to do this, what China did is that uh, party secretaries, governors of at least 22 provinces in central and western China, where the bulk of China's impoverished province population lives, 
they were asked to sign pledges regarding their poverty alleviation responsibilities. Um, they have been subject to various performance reviews by inspectors from Beijing every year. Uh, what has also taken place is that there's been a relocation of the poor from poverty-stricken regions to more developed urban areas. Um, this was done as part of this holistic plan to tackle rural poverty. Now, there are these guidelines on poverty alleviation, and the Chinese government identified that um, China's poverty reduction should guarantee access to food, clothing for poor populations, and a nine-year compulsory education for children from low-income families. So these programs also mention the need for meeting basic uh, medical needs and good living conditions for the population. In order to do this, Beijing dispatched 775,000 party officials to drive these anti-poverty campaigns. Uh, many officials went door to door to work out what the government can do to help. Um, and those who failed in their missions to alleviate poverty um, faced uh, career oblivion. If we look at poverty in China, what is visible is that more than half of the rural, rural poor population lives in the Western region. By the end of 2018, even though China's national poverty headcount ratio, which is the proportion of a population living below the poverty line, it dropped to 1.7%, there were seven provinces or provincial regions with a poverty headcount ratio higher than 3%. Poverty eradication is not something new. It has been a goal since 1950s. Under Xi Jinping, the goal has only taken a more serious form. And a year for the complete alleviation was decided upon. One of the main claims of the CCP to remain in power has been the fact that it has succeeded in lifting hundreds and millions out of absolute poverty. Therefore, the goal to eliminate um, you know, uh, poverty completely by 2021. This crux of this anti-poverty program was to empower poor villagers to lift themselves out of poverty by developing local industries, engaging in e-commerce, boosting rural tourism. And the Xi Jinping administration in 2019 alone spent about 19 billion US dollars on a variety of projects, which included infrastructure creation, uh, which would help people to lift themselves out of poverty. About um, more than 200,000 kilometers of roads were built in 2018 and after. 94% of poor villages were connected to internet as per government figures. Um, what the National Bureau of Statistics states is that in order to deal with poverty alleviation, what has been done is that um, there has been a lot of wage and transfer payments. Um, so, you know, wage and transfer payments ensured that wages for people in these poverty stricken areas increases a little bit. But the question which remains is whether this is adequate. Um, rural income actually has been in decline since 2014. And a major hurdle in the path of improving farm income is the fact that farmers do not possess the land that they till. All land in China is state-owned, and farmers have the right to use it under a renewable 30-year lease. Ownership is non-negotiable, and the farmers do not have the right to sell the plots of land that they are tilling. So this diminishes their financial security. Um, <clears throat> what was stated by Han Changfu, who was the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, is that there is a need to increase the income of the poor rural residents and to give them employment opportunities so that you know they can be prevented from slipping back into poverty again. How many people have actually slipped back into poverty? A lot of people have been pulled out of poverty, but how many have gone back and slipped back into poverty? Based on the statistics from um, the State Council leading group, Office of Poverty Alleviation, 6,84,000 people fell back into poverty in 2016, 2,8,000 in 2017, 58,000 in 2018. And these are statistics still before the pandemic um, broke out. So poverty alleviation rests on agricultural production, which faces dangers of produce and price fluctuations, which in turn are caused by factors such as weather and changes in international markets. Besides the problems of fluctuations, which may hurt these poverty alleviation programs, another question is, the, is, is that of the reach of the programs. Um, there have been a lot of studies which have been conducted uh, within China. And most of these reveal that people have been waiting for the poverty alleviation efforts to um, reach them. In scenarios wherein people are living in extremely difficult geographic terrains and they do not have jobs, the local government resettles the villages. As per these announced guidelines, 
new settlers go through a job training program they are given basic jobs so that they can survive in the new location but the relocation scheme has been mired in controversy because the relocated residents they are forced to give up their lands in exchange for extremely scarce compensation a significant number also end up moving back to their villages as they are unable to find work in cities they are not able to afford these high living costs in the cities um, what also becomes a push factor for these relocated villages to go back to their homes is the government's crackdown on poor migrant workers in big cities such as shanghai or peking because of the formidable hukou or the household registration system so these thriving mega cities mega cities <clears throat> they have officially capped their populations following existing residents worries that an influx of migrants will drown out their access to superior schools and hospitals so there's a clear contradiction of the relocation policies which are a part of the larger poverty alleviation program now the question arises what has been the status of poverty alleviation post the pandemic well the pandemic is still isn't still not over but largely in china uh, things seem to be coming back to normal um the pandemic has exposed <clears throat> the party shortcomings in providing um, its most vulnerable citizens with more than the barest of social safeguards especially in rural areas the government's response to the crisis has been favoring infrastructure spending and tax breaks for companies instead of direct aid for the families this has widened china's gap between the rich and the poor something which professor mohanty was also talking about inequality um and inequality is already amongst the highest in the world in china wealthier workers have largely kept their jobs and assets during the pandemic and uh, the millions of people who've been working on low incomes are working fewer hours at a lower pay depleting their own savings and taking out loans to survive Xi Jinping had told a United Nations meeting recently that China was undaunted by the strike of COVID-19. It would meet its poverty targets on schedule. He mobilized millions of officials and spent billions of dollars to meet his goal, a politically important milestone. It's not just economic, something which we were just talking about before uh, before I started speaking. It's a politically um, important milestone for the party before the centenary of the um, of of this year. the response to the pandemic has just exacerbated many long standing problems in the countryside for decades rural people have been treated have been have been treated as second class citizens limiting their access to high quality healthcare education and other benefits under this strict mao era hukou um more than 40% of the population or about 600 million people lived on less than uh, 5 us dollars a day last year these are according to government statistics China's efforts, early efforts to fight the COVID-19, including lengthy lockdowns across the broad areas of the country, left rural residents stranded, hundreds of miles from factories where they worked. Many were unemployed for months. Children also fell behind, lacking internet connections. Even though the government says that you know it has established a lot of internet connections, um, a lot of children were also um, lacking either hardware or internet connections to take part in online classes. So. Um, <clears throat> rural residents actually reported losing about 1/5 of their incomes in the first two months february and march last year um, and this is just last year um, food and uh, living costs were also rising so the government at that time and after that as well has directed much of its aid to businesses in urban areas the economy is still slow in many parts of china and rural residents are still left clueless about the social uh, safety that they have uh, social safety that they have <clears throat> Xi Jinping faces questions within the party about the extent to which this poverty elimination campaign is now for real, given the enormous assault that's happened on disposable incomes. Um, and many people have been left wondering that whether they, they actually have jobs or not. Has have their businesses gone bust? So even no, though the no, actually, no. okay, ma'am. So even though this goal of poverty alleviation might have been stated to have been accomplished. the fact that she has made such huge bold announcements um and given the fact that the credibility of the party hinges on poverty alleviation the reality is far away from the projected version and it is completely political in nature more than being economic in nature it's completely political so with that i'll just um, come to the end thank you so much ma'am okay um thanks sir uh, that was an extremely fine granular look at uh, reality on the ground and uh, 
I think there's a very little uh, debate uh, about how there is a huge gap between the perception and the reality. I think there are, um, given the nature of communications these days, there are enough reports uh, which bring out this uh, gap and in fact has raised serious concerns about the credibility of the uh, kind of uh, claims that are being made. So, um, so yes, we need to take uh, discussions on uh, such major kind of uh, landmarks and achievements uh, with a pinch of salt and examine as we, as scholars, we should really uh, look deeper into this and see what uh, is. So thank you very much. Uh, I now turn to our last speaker today, um, Patricio Guisto, and uh, he has a very interesting title, Keys to the Success of the CPC in the government of China. So um, I think uh, let's hear some nice things now, I guess. Uh, after all the hard questions and the very, very problematic kind of issues. Over to you, Patricia. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone from Buenos Aires. It is a great pleasure for me to take part in this academic session about the centenary of the CCP together with so prestigious scholars. I really appreciate uh, this kind of invitation and I hope in the future we can establish further cooperation with the academic institutions I represent in my country. Well, in my speech, I will present a brief historical review of the CCP trajectory. And after that, I will focus on what I consider to be the main keys to the success of the CCP in the government of China. Well, first of all, some remarks about the early times of the CCP. I think the trajectory of the CCP has been one of harsh obstacles and challenges from the very beginning. In fact, as you know, the CCP funders' uh, first challenge was having to escape police uh, pursuit in Shanghai. They had to interrupt the first party congress, which was completed on a rented boat in Chasing City. From then on, the history of the party will alternate achievements and misfortunes, such as the 1927 massacre perpetrated by the government of the Kuomintang. That incident in Shanghai was certainly a turning point that forged the character of the young communist cadres and gave way uh, to the Chinese Civil War. Around 1934, when the hope of the communists uh, seemed to be fading away, overwhelmed by the brutal campaign of annihilation launched by the Kuomintang, Mao Zedong and other communist leaders carried out the Long March, one of the epic moments in Chinese uh, contemporary history, maybe one of the greatest uh, military feats in world history. It was like a death march as the communists marched under permanent siege from the Kuomintang troops all along a very insane geography and with almost no material resources. However, as you know, a group of communist pioneers managed to reach their destination after marching for um, 370 days along almost 10,000 kilometers. In the isolated caves of Yan'an in Shanxi province in the north of China, I think the party organizational foundations were strengthened, the fundamental of communist ideology were reaffirmed, and the dream of a People's Republic under the leadership of Mao Zedong began to take shape there. Soon after, both uh, warring factions agreed to suspend the hostilities and form a united front in 1937 to fight against the Japanese invaders. At that point, it is important to remember, the communists were about to lose the civil war. And with the resumption of the war in 1945, the troops commanded by Mao were much larger and stronger. In a couple of years, the communists recovered strategic positions and defeated the Kuomintang. On October 1st, 1949, the People's Republic of China was created. That moment marked the beginning of a very turbulent period for China under Mao's rule. This period, period is characterized by China's international isolation in the context of the Cold War and also by deep economic decline as a result of Mao's disastrous collectivist policies. A strong contrast of, uh, with China's today, of course. 
millions of Chinese uh, starved to death after the Great Leap Forward, a plan for rapid industrialization that was a complete failure in a launch in 1958. And with the economy devastated and cornered by criticism within the CCP, Mao launched later the Cultural Revolution in 1966, one of the darkest times uh, in Chinese contemporary history. The Chinese youth responded to the call of their leader, launching a brutal and chaotic, chaotic uh, persecution against every element considered whether capitalist or traditionalist in Chinese society. And as the case of the Great Leap Forward, we still do not know for sure uh, with accuracy how many people died because of that uh, period. Perhaps uh, the greatest achievements of the Maoist period were the consolidation of territorial integration and the recovery of China's international dignity, as they call it, as the communists call it, after more than a century of humiliations at the hands of the great colonialist powers. It's important to know that by 1949, what currently is mainland China was totally ravaged by the civil war consequences and the country was disintegrated into various factions controlled by warlords and also by some Kuomintang remaining pockets of resistance. Mao managed to pull all those pieces together during the first years of the PRC. Of course, that meant to confront local minorities, in some cases, like the Tibetan people. In foreign policy, we must highlight, of course, the shift, maybe one of the greatest geopolitical turns of the Cold War, the rapprochement with the United States in 19. 72 with the aim of containing that common threat posed that time by the Soviet Union. After Mao's death, uh, there was a profound revision of the economic ideas. 1978, the reform and opening up process began, and no doubt that this change was the main driver of the future consolidation of China as an economic uh, and technological superpower. Uh, then Xiaoping's uh, successful reforms made possible what had been called the Chinese miracle, that golden period for China with impressive growth rates that were unprecedented in, in modern history. Then we have the Tiananmen massacre in June 1989, I think was a heavy blow, maybe the heaviest blow to the communist leadership in history. Despite the political turmoil that emerged, the party managed to reaffirm itself in the leadership of the country and was able to overcome the crisis. In the very same year, the Soviet Union collapsed. Once again, the CCP survived and there were no political changes. On the contrary, I think the result was more power centralization. After Deng's uh, retirement in 1992, the leader passed to Chiang Zemin, a successor that was not Deng's, Deng's uh, first choice, but who quickly displayed great uh, political and diplomatic skill, skills. Uh, the new leader was able to guarantee the continuity of Deng's economic policies. Part of Chiang's uh, great legacy was ensuring a peaceful transition of power to his successor, Hu Jintao, 2002. And this new leader set the main goal of consolidating the process of growth and economic development in China in the search for a harmonious society that was the concept and a peaceful rise of China, of China at the global stage. Meanwhile, in the West, the China threat theory was already being coined. Uh, and in two, finally, in 2012, there was a decisive change with the coming to power of, of Xi Jinping, who has definitely started a new era in China, marked by his two ambitious centennial goals in the year of the centenary of the Communist Party, today was reaffirmed this first goal of eradication of extreme poverty. Now China is heading to become a modern socialist country by 2049, uh, centenary of the PRC Foundation. Uh, President Xi has also established midterm goals that were announced last year to be accomplished by 2035 moment defined as the realization of socialist uh, modernization. And in foreign policy, I would like to highlight that she has promoted 
this building of a community of shared future for, man for mankind in contrast to the confrontational and unilateralist stance held by the United States uh, in recent years. This may change with Biden in power, but I think we have to wait a little and see what happens. She has proposed concrete realizations and not empty promises. I think that is one of the keys of his uh, strength in power within the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. And paradoxically, the tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic has proved she right about the need for global cooperation in order to overcome this unprecedented global threat. In that sense, sense China has sought to position itself as a responsible superpower, offering vaccines and health supplies to all the countries that require them, even the United States, of course, from the very beginning of the pandemic. That's another difference when we compare the kind of aid provided by the United States, country that it's just beginning to help other countries. Uh, and of course, China is also facing increasing international criticism and there is resistance to its economic uh, key projects, particularly from some US historic allies. And there are also doubts, as you know, about China's vaccines efficiency that is under discussion right now, among other issues. And China's, China's negative image is in fact on the rise in many countries. Finally, what will be the keys to the success of, of the CCP during these 100 years? I think the CCP, uh, first of all, has exhibited a line of continuity in its ideological foundations, successively incorporating the traditions of Marxism-Leninism, Maoism, contributions of Deng, Jiang, Hu, and finally the so-called Xi Jinping thought. These leaders have all been loyal followers of the legacy received, which they defended and improved with their wisdom, ideological, their ideological contributions, but also from their own experience leading the country. The CCP has been capable to evolve ideological throughout history. The communism we have today is not the same as the beginning. Uh, the party has done that, has done that with remarkable realism, pragmatism, long-term vision, and the characteristic meticulous planning of the CCP, especially since 1978. And the party has also proved its capacity to put aside the, the, the also characteristic complex bureaucratic routines and mobilize the entire political machinery when facing serious crises, such as the Hong Kong protest in 2019 and such as the pandemic today. In sum, I think the combination of this long-term policy planning with a flexible policy in experimentation in order to find in order to find the appropriate solutions for each particular situation explains a lot about China's economic success uh, today. Besides, power concentration at the top of the party has been another important key, something that Xi Jinping has taken to an unprecedented level since Mao Zedong's time. Those have, uh, have been some of the keys of this centennial success of the CCP. And despite the predictions we commonly listen in the West media and some academic circles about the possibility of collapse of the political system led by the CCP. Truth be told, regardless uh, we, la we may like that system or not, the fact is that the party looks stronger than ever at, in this centenary. And the social legitimacy of the party is not based only on repression or censorship, as many people often believe. It is based, above all, on the spectacular and unparalleled economic and social achievements, such as, as we, we heard before, this extreme poverty eradication. That is why I cannot imagine a big political crisis or, or a collapse of the system while China keeps with this economic and social performance. Quoting uh, Xi Jinping's speech today, he said, a century ago, China was in decline and withering 
away in the eyes of the world. Today, the image it presents to the world is one of a thriving nation that is advancing with unstoppable momentum toward rejuvenation. I think we have to acknowledge this and the naive fact of this monumental change. However, to conclude, it is also true that China faces important domestic challenges, such as an aging population and the accelerated process of migration of young people from rural areas to the big cities. And to make matters worse, there is an extraordinary critical international scenario for China, signed by the increasing confrontation with the US and the pandemic. All these factors could certainly derail China's course, but so far the party, I think, seems to be well aware and prepared, responding accordingly to deal with both the international and domestic challenges. Final question, uh, will Xi Jinping and the CCP overcome all these challenges? It's very hard to say, but in the meantime, I think it will be good to stop denying or misrepresenting some aspects of China's reality and its incredible potential, since the country is on its way to becoming the largest global superpower under this political system and under the leadership of this party that today celebrates 100 years. And that might happen much earlier, I think, than 2049. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Patricio. I, um, I thought that was a rather, I must say, neat narrative overview of the evolution and uh, journey of the Communist Party. And uh, you have certainly given very substantial reasons for your arguments about why the party is not about to collapse and uh, that it is grounded in this ability to be able to deliver uh, to the people. So uh, I think that was uh, a very useful presentation. We will now uh, open the floor for questions now. Uh, there are quite a large number uh, in the chat, um, but uh, the initial questions uh, are uh, not quite uh, clear in terms of who they are addressing those questions to. Uh, so I'll take the names one by one. Uh, and uh, you may please identify whether you want to address your question to, uh, to any specific person or would you like anybody to take it on, in which case I will leave it to the participants to offer their services to address that question. Um, I must uh, begin by um, reading out uh, Kishan Rana's uh, message uh, of compliments to Manu for posing hard, real questions. That's the very first comment that comes in and he says that we do not often encounter such hard questions in discussions. So uh, so he kudos to you too uh, for raising those. Uh, now, uh, Nathan Lobo was the first one, of course. Uh, no, actually, uh, Biswaru Mukherjee had raised his hand very first. Uh, I had noted that down. And uh, so if he would like to, because his question comes in later, but there's nobody he's addressed it to. Um, so, Viswarup, do you have any particular person? Your question is capitalism under communism. Will this formula work in new future uh, for building a good culture in the world? I think, uh, Manu, you should be the one to address that. Um, can you take that on? Yeah. Please unmute, sir. Yeah. yeah. At one level, China has proved that, uh, yes, uh, it can work. Uh, but then uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, there are costs. That is the point. I think all, all the panelists have raised. Uh, we all acknowledge uh, the many areas of success. And uh, the centralized leadership of the Communist Party uh, has become necessary to carry on the system. System of reforms of uh, several 
capitalist institutional measures and uh, Javin rightly pointed out how uh, you know Xi Jinping has brought back uh, the state control and has allowed plurality of experiments and policies uh, and uh, I think uh, Isto is very right that the legitimacy base of the uh, system lies in the fact that the livelihood conditions has been raised so prominently social and economic successes now uh, so the costs are a you will not then have the democracy that i believe that socialism is about you will not have a fast redu reducing inequality scenario but expanding and uh, Hemant is quite right this is the kind of questions I raised or many of you raised are being raised within China and they are being allowed uh, um, you know only certain kinds of activities uh, are suppressed or um, you know, which are perceived uh, as big threats to the system are suppressed uh, in fact uh, this data uh, I mean we have to discuss on a rural crisis in China, which is not being discussed <laughs> in the official press very much, uh, but within the party being discussed and policies on the ground are being introduced because the rural urban gap was three times uh, 10 years ago, sorry, 2016, five years ago, and now it is five times. That is the 2020 figure. In other words, the gap is growing, you see, uh, the average income. Uh, so, uh, and this is from Chinese sources, from surveys by Chinese scholars. Therefore, uh, to answer your question briefly, uh, yes, capitalist uh, economic systems and even sociocultural systems uh, can continue. Uh, and that is the kind of adaptation that uh, have been made. They go back to even Lenin. They say that uh, from new economic policy, uh, you can see that kind of thing. The new democracy, which allows allowed under Mao the bourgeoisie, and then the bourgeoisie is uh, put aside, then revived under Tang. See, and now full-blown partner in this uh, in this economic construction. And now when there are uh, international linkages and contradictions, uh, a part of the Chinese bourgeoisie is rebelling, but bulk of the Chinese bourgeoisie is cooperating with the system. Uh, this is the reality. Therefore, the answer is yes, uh, capitalist economy and the Communist Party leadership can continue. Even many elements of capitalist system of competition and profit maximization and uh, development of a capitalist class, China having the maximum billionaires in the world today. That also is a phenomenon. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, but for those who care about democracy, equality, uh, lessening of uh, cultural alienation, social alienation, uh, and uh, th things like that, they have to critically ask some questions as being asked within China uh, today. But this is not to say that the system is facing a uh, you know such a critical challenge that it will collapse. Nothing like that. Uh, I think uh, the uh, you know one one reason why stability is so important there to so stability and uh, real comforts for maximum number of people to increase that not all because as Sipurna pointed out um, you know, a large chunk of population it may not be 40 percent or 60 percent but certainly uh, nearly half the population are below the uh, five dollar a day uh, and even if you take the 500 million middle class as the statistics of uh, Chinese middle class you know what about the rest uh, nine, nine, 900 million you see and therefore um, there are questions to raise uh, 
in this context. Thank you, uh, Manu, for that. Um, now, I had a brief blip and my um, net suddenly went off and then I got back again. So as a consequence, the chat box questions are gone. Uh, but I had noted down those people who had. Uh, so if anybody's got the questions all in the chat box, uh, can read them out. But uh, Nathan was the second person to have raised his hand. He had subsequently typed his uh, question as well. So um, if uh, Nathan wants to read out his question, he can. He had addressed it to Hemant, as far as I uh, remember. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. May be granted permission to speak, ma'am. Yes, yes, please. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so my question was uh, a sort of like a twofold question. So the first one is, while talking about how the youth of China generally are embracing, you know, the traditional Mao Zedong art that had existed before uh, 1976 in China, um, does that apply to just the economic aspect of it or also the social and cultural aspect? Because Mao Zedong art does not necessarily cover only one part of um, you know, like the economic sphere of uh, China, I talked about the cultural and the social sphere of it. So do you think that the youth are um, longing for um, uh, a, a, a period back to Mao Zedong thought in all these respective fields? Or is it only the economic field wherein, um, you know, there was equality of all and the income in inequality was uh, minimal or did not exist uh, like how it does now? That is the first part. Um, should I proceed, ma'am, or...? Uh, uh, yeah, if you have a, a question to the same person, uh, or if uh, you have a question to another person, ask both your questions and then we'll go down the answers. All right, ma'am. Thank you. So the second question is, uh, I think recently there was a survey conducted which said that more than 90% of uh, the uh, Chinese population is satisfied with the current uh, existing government. So do you think that um, knowing this in mind, do you think that people still want to go back to that period of um, Mao Zedong's era, despite the fact that they are uh, satisfied, as the poll shows, they are satisfied with the current regime? Because there is a stark difference in both of them. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, Hemant, uh, okay. your turn. But uh, let me just add one here, because there is one question, another question for you from Santosh. And he says, and maybe you can, because I think you can really lapeto it in the answer that you gave, is he says, you have spoken about victim mentality and Western bias. Um, does the much talked about wolf warriors result from this mentality? Okay. okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alka. Uh, I've read both the questions uh, from Mr. Santosh Panda and also uh, Mr. Nathan Lobo, both the parts of Nathan Lobo's questions. So let me try and uh, very quick uh, in replying to these questions. I'll first begin with the simpler question, which was from Santosh Panda about the victimhood. I actually did not use the word victim uh, or victimhood in my brief presentation. But if the impression has gone out like that, so uh, I'm OK with the question. And uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's not the communist China which is the victim. It is China which is the victim. And, and uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that many Chinese today will tell you, and I've been hearing this from the Chinese for the last more than three, four decades now, since my interaction with the chi Chinese friends, that it's not, you know, it's, it's not communism or communist China per se. The contradiction will be and is, as is being reflected today, between China and the U.S., so the question here is that uh, why this contradiction does not be, did not become so prominent uh, as it is now because for the last three four decades we've been seeing that Chinese and the U.S. economy, for example, has been very closely integrated, and uh, that is why Professor Monti's point and also many people are saying that today it's very difficult to de determine whether we are looking at a socialist China or a capitalist China whatever other uh, neologisms you may use, that's okay. But as Patricio, uh, my co-panelist, also raised a point, which I think is very important here. He said that as uh, in 2010, if I remember hearing him, he said that in 2010 in the West, especially in the US, the China threat theory started or discourse started gaining ground. 
So my question basically is this, that why 2010 and why not earlier? I mean, uh, and victimhood, if the Chinese are saying, like Xi Jinping said today in his speech, that China will never be bullied again. So these are the questions for us to understand that why did the West start saying China is a threat in 2010 and not in 1990 or not in 1989 when the human rights and democracy and democratic protests were being crushed, etc., etc. So, uh, so, so victimhood is a very uh, complex issue uh, which, which should be best left for a larger debate. Now, moving on to the second question by Nathan. You see, uh, uh, of course, it will be foolish to say that uh, anywhere or in China in particular, whether it is Generation Z or Millennials in China today, uh, they are trying. I mean, nobody is trying to revive the uh, pre-reform Mao era. I think the essential question here is, uh, for example, the younger generation today, which is more now inclined towards the original uh, tenets of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought, they are being attracted towards these uh, ideas because what they see around themselves today. And don't forget that these are the people who were born and who grew up in a China which was the most prosperous in modern Chinese history, the period. And it is these very people who are now expressing their dissatisfaction the way in which they see around themselves the social injustice uh, growing and the inequality gap uh, widening and the state not being able to either show uh, sensitivity or not being able to do anything. Whether you take, Sriparna mentioned various aspects, whether you take educational sector, whether you take healthcare sector or various others. As Professor Monti also pointed out in his reply, that okay, 400 or 500 million Chinese may be well off today, but what about the 900 million Chinese population? So these are the questions and these are the stark realities. The survey you mentioned, of course, uh, beyond a point, the surveys don't, do not tell us much actually. Uh, so, I mean, as, as you know, uh, 10 different experts can have different conclusions based on the same survey. So let's not go into that. But uh, essentially what I'm saying is that uh, there is, a, I mean, there is a feeling, there is a certain element of uh, frustration and dissatisfaction in the way uh, things are unfolding in China today, whether it is a political front, whether it is ideological front, whether it is any other aspect. And I'll just give you one example. For example, a new term has been coined, which I could not say because of the shortage of time, which is socialist nihilism, which is becoming very dominant in ideological discourse or political discourse today. Professor Monti is smiling. Maybe that is the contribution of Xi Jinping's signification of Marxism. And Xi Jinping himself had said in February this year that uh, we will not tolerate socialist nihilism. So what is this socialist nihilism? I, I already referred to the the way that many young people, universities, scholars, intellectuals, graduates, they are being they are they are showing their resentment against the way from top down the official discourse is being thrust upon them. For example, the analysis of cultural evolution. So that is a part of socialist nihilism. Socialist nihilism basically means that if you say anything which the party regime today does not accept, then you are challenging the CPC rule, or you are challenging the CPC ideology. I think I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Heyman. So now, uh, the next question, uh, actually, uh, in the, so, Sri Parna has very kindly copy-pasted the questions to me. Now, there's a very intriguing uh, um, participant here, uh, whose name is The Journey Goes On. <laughs> that's, I don't know who exactly it is, but uh, the question from Journey Goes On is what three things today's India should emulate from the last one century and present trajectory of China? And what three things must be avoided at any cost? Now, these are like, you know, huge, huge questions. I don't know. Um, would anybody want to address it? Because this is just open. 
madam this was a question from my side open to the entire panel oh and uh, ma'am okay. myself cut number cut number from cdm ma'am ah uh, ma'am uh, this cut number kumar from cdm secunderabad ma'am okay well we yeah. trust you army to come straight to the jugular now what should we do and what we shouldn't do anybody wants to take it on that was my point ma'am yeah, yeah. Okay, Jabin, please go ahead. Okay, because uh, I, I mean, I think nobody was speaking. I thought, okay, first uh, let me say that uh, I mean, actually, they are two related. Uh, you know, uh, what we should do is what we should. Uh, you know, is also related to what we should not do. Firstly, do not fudge figures. Uh, in India, I certainly don't think we are as good as the Chinese at fudging figures, and we shouldn't try it. Uh, I think that's one thing. Second. Uh, we need uh you know it's often said that uh, in india the prob problem is too much democracy actually the problem isn't too much democracy the problem is that we lack accountability in our public sector uh, this little or no accountability everybody uh, you know the society is very very deeply divided and i think that's one thing we can learn from the chinese break your feudal system uh for for all mao's faults the chinese destroyed feudalism uh, in in a substantive manner which is partly uh, the reason why they have managed their economic growth so uh, if we can do that uh, if we can eliminate uh, or acknowledge firstly that caste is a problem and that if we can work at eliminating mm -hmm. that rest of it will follow uh, so yeah i mean it's not one two three i mean i don't uh, sort of you cannot categorize these as one to three questions but uh, i mean that's the way to go yeah uh, we we need to hold stronger to our own constitutional values uh, we cannot undermine institutions at the expense uh, you know, we cannot uh, promote individuals at the expense of institutions uh, simple thing thanks okay great um, we are last uh, in the constitution okay so that's that's one very substantial uh, thing. Now there is a question here from Shivana wants to answer. Shivana, oh, Shivana wants to come in there. Okay, go ahead, Shivana. Ma'am, I'll just make two just two quick points, adding to what Jabin said. Um, the first is, what should we um, do? Um, A, what you know, something which China does is have. Fixed goals and keep eyes on the target without getting sidelined by smaller issues. Um, what sh what should we not do? Create bigger than life figures the way Mao Zedong was created, put putting him on a pedestal, or the way Xi Jinping is going. Uh, this is something which we should not ape. We should not do at all. And uh, something which we also should not do, which China also should not do, but is doing, is stifling dissent. So just wanted to quickly come in uh, on these points. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, uh, Shivana. Now, uh, yes, anybody else wants to say? Okay, there are there are some really big questions coming along. So let me go on with you. Deem, uh, before I uh, get on to the next one, how long do we go up to? Uh, we can have until 5.30. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so fine, fine. Then that, that yeah. takes care. That will take care yeah, of 30 something. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Now, Nachi K has asked a question uh, again to nobody in particular so volunteers here uh, the centenary of uh, cpc being an important historical event the risk tolerance of china was possibly low in the last few months with the historical event out of the way do you expect increased belligerence from china in the next few years uh, ma'am the question is open to all the panelists uh, okay. primarily the background is that uh, showing the prosperity the path to prosperity was possibly the political aim for this historical event and that having been achieved now will the focus shift towards territorial integrity and the security aspects well it doesn't seem to me that they were in any uh, way uh, putting aside the territorial objective and aside and, and focusing only I, I think it was they were going on all fronts uh, full steam so uh, it's not as if it was a sequential thing but anybody who would like to address that and the story is not yet over as Sri Parna has said they have not completed um, achieving their goals so yes who will take that up Patricia, so, Patricia. Yeah, Patricia. I can make a, a brief comment on this um, yes, 
I think the focus of, of China's politics will continue to be the economic development and the expansion of economic global influence. It's not that the military act aspect, I think, is attached to the um, to to defend and protect the sovereign uh, sovereign integrity. Uh, and quoting again, as I did in my speech, Xi Jinping's uh, today at Tiananmen, uh, we we will not we will uh, we will not hesitate to protect our territorial integrity of external threats. So if China feels there is a direct aggression on on its territorial integrity, we will may have we we may we might have increased uh, belligerence. But in the meantime, I think the, the priority of China is economic development and the expansion of its global economic influence. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm afraid that's a rather simplistic view. Uh, you can't believe everything that Xi Jinping spouts from the uh, podium. Uh, I mean, he's absolutely right in saying that uh, Xi Jinping, I mean, China will defend its territorial integrity. But the problem is, uh, what is China's territory? China's conception of territory and sovereignty is very, very different from our conception of China's territory and sovereignty. So, sure. uh, uh, you know, I, I think I agree with uh, Alka in saying that China hasn't really set aside anything. You will find actually that China has actually increased, if anything, its uh, uh, salami slicing, its provocations uh, into, say, Taiwanese airspace, uh, Taiwanese waters. So all of that is actually going on side by side. Uh, I mean, look, look at what China is doing rather than only what, what China is saying. Though China, what China says is equally important. Uh, and there is really no contradiction or a, no separation in categories between China's economic development and China's foreign policy. In fact, I think these are increasingly integrated. One leads to the other. Uh, the BRI is a classic example. China said we will not uh, put up bases outside, but uh, Chinese economy has expanded so much. Chinese citizens are in other countries. And now China says we have to have the means to defend our citizens, pull our citizens out of trouble spots. So therefore, China builds up uh, you know, naval capacity builds up bases. Uh, so all of that is going on. And CPEC right next to us, next door to us, it's an ostensibly economic project. But once Chinese citizens start getting targeted, Chinese want security, Chinese want involvement. So I'll go on. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, the next question really um, uh, from um, Bhaskar Gogoi. Uh, now, this is a question which has essentially been agonizing a large number of people in the West, uh, particularly. I, I don't see uh, the non-Western areas asking this so much, although increasingly now, some sometime we have occasionally seen it. But this question is, how long can the Chinese Communist Party survive? So this perpetual way. I know I remember when Tiananmen happened and after that there was this... Uh, a uh, book by Gordon Chang, The Coming Collapse of China. And he predicted five years. And uh, five years happened and everybody asked Gordon Chang, well, what happened? China hasn't collapsed. And he said, uh, then he revised his estimate and said, OK, I need uh, you know five more years. And after that, China will collapse. And five more years passed by and still didn't collapse. And then, uh, so now I'm going to joke a bit about this, because then when Gordon Chang was asked about it, he said, yeah, I told you, now it's coming. So it's perpetually coming, right? So in one sense, this coming collapse of China is something that uh, a large amount of Western discourse has always been grappling with. Will China be an insecure and aggrieved power or a confident and responsible one? Um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll open it to the panelists, but this, this notion of a dissatisfied power, an aggrieved power, um, uh, a belligerent, I think we need to understand that the logic of power in the international system has its has has a, it has a peculiar logic in its own. And uh, whether we see the the big powers in the past or we see now China, I mean that's something coming out of what Professor Monty raised right at the very beginning. That while the Chinese do claim to say that uh, oh we will never be hegemonic, uh, I think we need to question that a bit more closely and need to ask whether. China is actually behaving like any other power. 
so uh, so that's that's where I'll leave it. But I, I'll open it to the panelists to address this question: Will China be insecure or responsible? But you have answered that question. I think we can move on to other questions. Uh, if there's nobody who would like to come in there, then I'll move on to the next question. All right. Uh, now, um, Nirmal Panda uh, says, Dear Professor Mohanty, what do you exactly mean socialism with Chinese characteristics? And what are these characteristics which other communist nations don't have? Well, uh, that's it. That's a lecture, class lecture, yes. <laughs> oh, so you're muted, sir. Uh, that's a term that I have not coined, but I have examined that term coined by the Chinese, first by Tang Xiaoping, uh, then, you know, in different forms. Uh, and, uh, 82 Congress, Party Congress, then 84, that is market socialism, then 84, then 97, you know, then on. That is the history of that term. And the Chinese characteristics are that uh, the it will have market role of the market number one in other words state and market number two uh, the party will uh, rule uh, but it will also allow some cooperative other political parties that is the political system uh, uh, number three and there are many other uh, you know in management in uh, politics and economy and culture, uh, particularly in the political system and the uh, economic uh, features of capitalism and socialism and the Chinese version of multiple ownership of many, uh, you know, many economic activities. And this is explained. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, but at one time it meant that this kind of socialism is unique to China. We are experimenting and we have found it useful but for the last uh, i mean ever since uh, xi jinping uh, took over particularly in the 19th party congress report it became very clear that they want the world particularly the developing world also to see if they can also emulate this model the chinese system uh, and uh, in the last one month of many statements uh, you find that, you know, uh, not only an assertion that the Chinese political system and economic system, not just the economic system, the Chinese political system has its vitality. Only one statement day before yesterday said that the Chinese party system will constantly improve. This declaring that we have grounds to improve, you hear less and less in the Xi Jinping period. Okay, a more assertion and explanation of the vitality and effectiveness of the present Chinese policies, political, economic, social, cultural, on all fronts. Uh, but that is extremely, uh, that is extremely uh, unusual because you know the whole creative development meant that every time and this new era adaptation should always mean improvement, changing for the better, and so on. Uh, so. That is the background to socialism with Chinese characteristics. But today, it is the Chinese system in all respects, which is the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Thanks, Manu. So uh, we have some more questions. But in between, uh, Anurag Prakash had uh, raised their hands. So sequentially, if we say, so Anurag, uh, will you uh, go ahead with your question, please? Um, Ma'am, I just want to know that does public opinion makes any difference to the perception or policies of uh, the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, the public or the Chinese public opinion. And if yes, how are they responsive to it, or how they actually uh, calibrate their policies as per the public opinion? I'll uh, request uh, Hemant and uh, Shri Varna to come in here. Hemant is looking at very closely at 
what the Chinese people are saying and what the party is saying. So maybe he can join them together and answer this. Hemant? Uh, okay, uh, very quickly and briefly. Uh, I mean, I think Alka mentioned in her article today in the Hindu, and she quoted Tang Xiaoping, uh, who said, uh, I think after the collapse of Soviet Union, that uh, he told his party colleagues that comrades, you must not, you cannot and you must not uh, forget your own history. I, I, I think uh, Chinese Communist Party took this lesson uh, to to this. I mean, just as they say that uh, very literally, and they saw to it that. Uh, that the fundamental mistake which the Communist Party of Soviet Union did, that means in, in, in terms of uh, it got cut off from the people, from the masses, that, that they have to be very careful. And uh, that is why there is, I mean, I, I don't know, there are all kinds of figures which one re reads in various kinds of reports coming from various sources. That even for, for for example the cyber censorship authority in China or something uh, which which who has the main task of monitoring what comes on the social media websites etc etc I think last time I read somewhere was that there are more than three million people employed to uh, monitor the social media in China and uh, you know keep a tab and then uh, keep the party establishment updated uh, that is at one level and second um, i think if we know the functioning of the party in china uh, for example when the party congresses take place i think the whole process of uh, what decisions finally are announced at the party uh, congress forums the making of these decisions also it's a long uh, long term exercise which takes at least 8 months to 1 year actually to prepare those uh, opinions which are finally then placed on the agenda in the party congresses and the whole exercise takes so much time because of the uh, feedback which has which is taken from the grassroots level also so, so one can say that the party's eyes and ears is always open and it's very, very integrated with the reality. So, of course, public opinion does matter. It, I think it, it matters uh, most in a, in a society like China, which is governed by one party and if that party happens to be Communist Party. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, I think Sripanna, you can you know supplement it here because you look closely at the poverty alleviation policies, and then you probably are looking at other policies as well. And in this whole process of policy formulation, as Vimant is saying, the role of what the people are saying and their views and their critiques, they all get factored in. So can you sort of talk a bit about that so that you could address Anurag's question? Um, as Professor Adlaka already mentioned, you know, there are about 3 million people closely monitoring um, social media sites and what people are saying. But does that really prevent people from stating what they want to state? Um, just let's just take the example of Dr. Lee Vanlia. He had uh, first sounded the warning bell regarding COVID-19 and uh, the strain. Once he put out his views, he was uh, called by the Wuhan police. He was well, questioned. A lot of things happened after that. Also, when the government was giving out this opinion uh, or this image that uh, it has things under control when the COVID when COVID nineteen was spreading, there were a lot of uh, netizens who actually took to the you know different sorts of social media sites um, and risked their own lives and they put out photos and information about what was actually happening. So there was a lot of uh, photographs circulating on what was actually happening on the ground in hospitals. So people do want to express themselves. It does get removed very easily because of the surveillance. That's a separate thing. Um, I'll quickly borrow from this one point which uh, Jebin had made, and he had spoken about Ranjit Chiang 
um, you know, who was penalized. Then there were intellectuals and professors last year, like uh, Su Chong Ron, uh, Su Chir Yong, uh, Chang Sui Chong, Yu Lin Chi, all of them demanded on WeChat that Xi Jinping steps down. So all of this is closely monitored because this might, uh, you know, this, this is a sort of questioning of the government, which the government would not want to entertain. They would not want something which happened uh, back in the 1950s when Pang Da Hwai, in his famous uh, letter of opinion, had questioned Mao Zedong's policies of the Great Leap Forward. So that is carefully taken cognizance into. But would they change their policies? Um, they would take cognizance. And if they really feel that this might be a huge issue, slight tinkering might be done. But would that really mean that there's a huge policy change? I do not think so. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shikuna, for that. Uh, I, I think this is an interesting point, and we could just take it up a little bit more because it is, I, in many ways, it, it, it goes to the heart of why the party is um, in the position that it is. And uh, maybe Patricio can come in here a bit. But I, I think, you know, let's uh, also understand that when uh, maybe Anurag can then also specify, when he's talking about public opinion, there is a distinction between, say, public opinion on matters related to policies, on matters related to their grievances, their demands, uh, among other things, to the party for uh, improving their situation, etc. And another set of views, uh, which could be critiques, uh, criticisms, um, intellectual dissent, uh, academic dissent, scholarship, which differs from the party line. Now, I think we need to actually segregate this, because if we take everything together, then uh, we are we are then missing uh, the, the manner in which the Chinese political system functions. Um, this is uh, this this is a very it's not, it's not a democracy, a liberal democracy, though they say they have democracy with Chinese characteristics. So, uh, public opinion. Um, what did you have in mind, Anurag, when you were talking about public opinion? Ma'am, I was more talking about the Chinese policy in the international arena. That's why I asked that, uh, like what happened in uh, Eastern Ladakh or before that in Doklam or what China is doing in the South China Sea, is the uh, Chinese public opinion in uh, consonance with the Chinese policy makers or whatever they are doing? Ah, okay, so this is an entirely different uh, ball game entirely. So then you are talking about, say, uh, the people expressing their views nationalist or otherwise about what is happening so uh, well who would like to take it on i mean we will stay uh, we, we don't want to stray too far away from our essential focus uh, so briefly if anybody can talk about that yes patricio please come in yes just a, a brief comment about this because unfortunately i, I don't have a opinion polls data to to support my my opinion it's it, it is just uh, my perception i think that the chinese public uh, mostly supports the the Chin uh, chinese government actions in the international arena such as these uh, conflicts you have mentioned with india and the actions in the south china sea because there is a uh, an important rise of nationalism and especially especially in the chinese youth this is something very, very remarkable for me. Um, some of this has been discussed in previous presentations in this panel, but we need a, a deeper look, I think, into this because it's something very important how the, the Chinese youth is slowly becoming the most important uh, support base for the Communist Party actions. And the, the, the actions in the international arena are um, a reason um, of pride, of pride. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese youth, I think they, they feel very proud of the actions of China in the international arena, and I think they mostly support it. But again, I don't have uh, significant data or opinion polls because not this kind of, of research is not conducted uh, today in China nation nationwide. So it's my perception and some statistical data I can I can get into, but that's all. That's all from from me. Uh, can I can I add a word? Yeah. Yes, please, please. Uh, 
I think uh, 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 Patricio is quite right uh, in, uh, you know, there is a general nationalist upsurge. So that is the whole line, especially about foreign policy and the, you know, the question of China's uh, global prestige. Uh, but the original question I thought was about not only policy support, but also policy making and policy shifts. Uh, because even when there are nationalist uh, waves, policy shifts do take place. Uh, for example, on the one hand, you have very strong anti-US statements, but also meetings do take place. You know, certain agreements also take place, like climate change and other things. Uh, same with India. So these are not zero-sum games, and none of these waves really are constraints on the decision-making capacity of the leadership because these are also subjected to a lot of discussions at various levels. And Chinese policy-making, like most countries, but uh, I think the uh, governmental think tanks and the non-governmental think tanks and the various kinds of advisory bodies and interconnected bodies and independent channels that the Politburo has um, and now with Xi Jinping's many other new uh, groups and institutional innovations. Uh, so what are the various views? The access to a range of views is very important. This is number one. Number two, every major social economic policy particularly and political institutional change uh, is first drafted as a party idea, sometimes a resolution. Then it is discussed widely. And many drafts and proposals are uh, received. And if there are laws, there are uh, hearings, public hearings on those laws held in all, you, all major cities and many other cities, then even right up to county government, sometimes invitations are made to send reactions. So the, um, therefore, just the social, and of course, social media is one forum, but the policy making process has many inputs. This is very important. And all the major institutional innovations from Mao to Xi Jinping, they are also first sounded out even in Tang's time, whether it is a uh, production responsibility system, not only commune, Kung <laughs> uh, to production responsibility system, to uh, many of Xi Jinping's visits and then summing up, and later on he announces that such and such thing came from such and such area. So the policy make, therefore, please don't have a monolithic notion about public opinion character in China or India or US. These are highly differentiated and uh, highly diverse uh, situations in all countries. And in China, we know it has some special features. Oh, thanks. That was that was really uh, very helpful. I think, uh, Anurag, if uh, you were having some kind of uh, let's say, different levels at which you wanted to understand what is the role of how people think and how people would like uh, their views to be heard by the government and party. Okay, now we've got just about a little over five minutes left and uh, I have uh, two or three questions more, but uh, I'm going to exercise chair's privilege and request uh, Kabilan uh, to address this question to Jacob separately, because uh, it's all about uh, India, China, border, and so on. And I think we should very strictly steer clear from the India-China business. Uh, this is about uh, the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, so, um, Beam, you could possibly give uh, uh, Jabin's contact to Kabilan. And uh, I think I'm going to combine two or three questions here um, 
and make it a one general question which can actually be the finale where all participants uh, should 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 address that question okay now one part one side of the question is this that china is all set to overtake the us what the entire world thinks tomorrow china thinks today should we see china as the new power who will hegemonize the world and turn it into a unipolar world uh, china's advancement in all the sectors might leave other actors behind what is your opinion and then one question which came in uh, just about towards the end which was that uh, uh, um, there's one small brief question, Jabin, to you. Maybe you can quickly take it in and then we'll take this larger question that if China continues to keep the party above everything, continues to crush people like Jack Ma, is the younger generation okay with that kind of communism? Just take a minute and address this and then we'll take this last question. Yes, Jabin. Is the younger generation okay with crushing Ma? I, I think Hemant sort of answered this question already. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, and I think, uh, you know, what he said was very apt, which is that it is not as the younger generation is without views. Uh, and really, Jack Ma is not the epitome of uh, whatever the younger generation is looking up to or looking forward to. Um, I think we have a division in Chinese society where I think it was you who mentioned it. There is a uh, or Professor Monty, in fact, there are a bunch of people who find advantages in going along with the system. Uh, and this inequality, increasing inequality in Chinese society is really what is bothering uh, the Communist Party, which is why she talks about this principal contradiction. I mean, Sriparna made this point about, uh, I mean, in her, uh, about how China has raised 800 million people out of poverty. But what we forget is that why was it 800 million people in poverty? Uh, you know, China actually put a lot of people in poverty too during the Great Leap Forward Cultural Revolution, and it required time to recover. So, even in front, once you dip that low, the only way you can go is to basically raise them out of poverty. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we'll have to sort of wait and watch how this goes. The Communist Party is extremely efficient in molding uh, narratives, shaping narratives, controlling, constricting the kind of information youngsters have. But the Chinese people are not stupid. If you just look at the way the Chinese people play with the language, get around censors, use new language, new words, create new words, uh, it's it's just brilliant. I mean, it's that's an art form that they have done. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Now we in the last uh, three minutes or so that we have, we're going to uh, go where, around all the panelists and take this large question, uh, which we, which is to do with the theme that Dean has set up for this. Uh, this uh, webinar and it's basically about how what what lies ahead what what is the kind of china that we are going to see in the uh, in the future and when the he keep, the question keeps talking about will we see china as a new power i think it is associated with how this this leadership by the communist party is going to shape china's future trajectory uh, so basically will it be the new hegemon uh, or will it be the new unipolar power and um, what what is it that we should expect um so let me start with professor monty again go around the panel and just make this kind of concluding comments and address this issue please thank you you know in china like in many countries there are multiple trends and uh, and what is the official pronunciation pronouncement should not blind us from seeing those multiple trends. It's very important. So uh, nobody in the 21st century can be a hegemon, not even the United States. And in China, the internal debates, as well as many schools of international politics debates openly, they discuss this. The era of hegemony is over. But there are very clear policy advisors who also say that, but, you know, to, to compete with the United States, you have to have certain characteristics of great powers. So there are those contradictions. U.S. having lost Vietnam War, having lost uh, in Iraq, having lost in Afghanistan, still has policy advisors who want uh, America to dominate the rest of the 21st century. And many in China want China to be like that and so on. 
but there are also objective trends in the world in china and in the us many people recognize that that the era of hegemony global hegemony is over and more than anything else covid has proved it number one second and last point is that you know i am very critical of this nationalist uh, observance as i mentioned i would have liked how chinese people have been rejuvenated why they should uh, because the, the reference is very much to the people but we see all the characteristics of what can be a very assertive nationalism okay which was humiliated and so on i mean chinese people were humiliated all ethnic groups were humiliated the classes were humiliated and so on therefore from nation to people people seen in classes ethnicity gender areas uh, that is the new era of you know self rule self urges and within china uh, when they see that whether it is tibet xinjiang you know you have to prove that the chinese system can accommodate xinjiang ethnicity and not by repression and not by economic development of xinjiang so also the but so the uh, new challenge of ethnicity is different similarly the old belief that either socialism or modernization or economic development will reduce disparities is wrong you have to take autonomous special measures to address gender in, uh, injustice regional injustice and so on but some of those uh, measures of industrial revolution mindset of economic growth are still guiding because china wants to be a big industrial modern and you know that uh, phrase for 2040 49 the second centenary great modern prosperous socialist country i think that's a very dangerous uh, formulation i would like china to be a great socialist country not big not taco ah uh, but uh, kaoliang the Chavi Chavi Kochia, beautiful socialist country. Okay. Ma'am, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, so, Manu, that that was that was really very succinct and pithy. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Shriparna to come in next because she has uh, the next generation's demands on her pressing. So, Shriparna, yours. Thank you, ma'am. Um, today, in in today's speech, Xi Jinping has warned about how China won't be bullied, and he said that you know um, China is not going to allow any sanctimonious preaching or bullying from foreign forces. So that in itself is quite a big message as to um, how China is going to behave in the next few years, um, in the next few decades to come. Um, will it try to be the hegemon? Well, as theories of IR teach us, um, the best way to secure oneself is to be the hegemon. that's the best way you can ensure that you are uh, you survive in this um anarchic international system wherein there are um, no central organizations or bodies to enforce laws so um just like any other powerful country china will also try to seek hegemony will it succeed um not really because um again as principles of neo realism tell us whenever there's some sort of power um increase in one particular state there will be an equal amount of um increase in power in the other states either by bandwagoning or by looking into their own domestic um powers etc so um it's still going to be largely a multipolar world but china's power is something to be um something which has to be reckoned with china will use all sorts of opportunities which um this pandemic has brought to it um things like it 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 started reopening its economy from an earlier date as compared to the other states um or it's um or or because of the fact that it's a manufacturing platform it could come up easily with uh, manufacturing these pandemic goods which is going to add to its coffers to its economic strength so um china is definitely going to be something that we cannot ignore in the near future so um that's my two cents on this thank you ma'am thanks a lot shriparna i think uh, we can permit you to leave uh, hemant please. thank you ma'am okay um i'll be very quick and i'll try to uh, relate uh, to my topic uh, for today 
and uh, as i had posed this question earlier referring to uh, uh, patricio's point of uh, china threat theory coming into dominance in 2010 so my basic point is that chinese uh, communist party regime today which is seen by many within china as pursuing neo liberal policies and which is in close uh, hand in hand with the global finance capital so that is why the cpc regime today feels threatened by the radical left within china and that is why we also keep hearing reports that even the marxist uh, youth or students in peking university in chingwa uwan university etc from time to time they are being arrested and put in prison that is on the one hand and on the other hand then why this contradiction between america and china and why now because the us uh, the global finance capital is centered in us today and the reason being that the the pace with which china has been growing that has overtaken the pace of the us economic growth and that is where the us is scared of losing its hegemony to another rival uh, neo liberal regime so as a result uh, this uh, th that's why uh, trump uh, ensured and many people in america are saying that uh, what trump has done will be endured for the next two or three or maybe four administrations in the us and that is why biden is being seen as more hawkish and anti china than trump that is because us is unable to increase its pace of uh, economy and what jebin had earlier mentioned about china that foreign policy and economic development cannot be seen separately the same is true for the us that is why the last month's uh, us uh, uh, house passed a bill which was called competitive competition competitive bill or something which in the us media is actually being called china competitiveness act because 250 billion dollar bill is actually meant to help us economy accelerate its pace of growth and uh, match china so in 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 brief what i'm basically saying is that on the one hand you see that it is a global finance capital and that answered the question somebody had raised that how long chinese communist party rule or socialism will survive in china so my answer is that as long as china continues to be protected by the global finance capital in other words as long as it continues to pursue the neo liberal policies thank you thanks uh, himanta there is an intriguing intriguing um, thing lurking in your uh, in your your response that uh, if china does become the hegemon it will be because of the us uh, not uh, you know <laughs> all right uh, jabin yeah um all right since we are talking about the communist party uh, let's uh, draw a distinction between the communist party of china and china itself uh, the party would like us to forget that distinction but uh, that distinction remains so when you ask about questions of hegemony you know a country can choose to uh, take decisions based on larger interests say okay you know we lay low for now uh, maybe hegemony will not work for us etc but for a political party and we see this uh, in india itself a political party especially of the nature of communist party of china has a very different uh, calculus of survival of existence for a political party like the cpc hegemony is absolutely necessary because otherwise how will it survive uh, it cannot provide space to the others so uh, i think if we sort of make this distinction we look at the same question can draw give us different answers and uh, you know my favorite example is of uh, how will india behave as a hegemony just look at how the board of control for cricket in india behaves it's an absolute hegemon in in uh, cricket right it's a completely no holds barred uncouth uh, actor uh, tells everybody else what to do uh, so i mean it's kind of like that i i think if you make a distinction between the cpc and the and china itself Uh, so yeah i will leave you guys with that thought thank you very much for this it's a great interesting, session interesting uh, interesting jabin this distinction uh, however it still begs the question that if the party decides to go on that path 
what do the people do uh anyway that's well, just an open-ended <laughs> question okay uh we'll leave it we, we, we can have uh, a debate some other time but patricio you will have the last word thank you thank you for being the last word uh <laughs> It's an honor to me. I think what comes ahead is, it is hard to say, but China, I see a China with more power centralization at the hands of the party, but with very tough challenges ahead, both domestic and international, as I have commented on, on my speech. Uh, in foreign policy, we will see more assertiveness uh, in an increasing in hostile international scenario for China and more search for self-sufficiency. Uh, I think that is the, the most important thing that the conflict with the US and the pandemic brought for China. It's an important reaccommodation of, of priorities. And the country is definitely on its way to becoming the biggest economic superpower, but that will not necessarily lead uh, to a unipolar world, as many say. And there are two main, re two main reasons uh, for that. China is not lying, I think, when it says it's not searching for hegemony, as it has never searched before in its uh, millenary history. And on the other hand, the US will continue to be the biggest military superpower. The gap is too, is too wide and it will continue to widen. And besides, and maybe more important, the US will continue to preserve an important network of allies based on shared values and interests that are totally opposite to those uh, defended by Beijing. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, Patricia. I think these these were very very balanced. Uh, um, well, it now remains for me to uh, to to just thank all the panelists. I, I just like to, in conclusion, uh, just raise three points uh, which uh, which people would what maybe can take home with them and think about it. You know, I start by what Professor Monty said, that uh, this this is not, nobody is now going to be in a position to become just the single most dominant hegemon. Uh, the very nature of the threats facing the world uh, ensure that one person, one country cannot really um, sit and call the shots. Uh, it's going to be a very different ball game from now on. And uh, and whether we believe China when it says that it does not want to be the hegemon or we don't believe, uh, the fact is that, yes, it's going to grow more powerful, uh, it's going to become uh, maybe somewhat more assertive. Uh, but there, I think we need to also understand the countercurrents again, which Professor Monty mentioned and Heyman brought it up in his, uh, that, that there's going to be a groundswell. And if we take German's point about um, the difference between the party and the people, there will be reactions, there will be uh, different trends that will that will rise and coalesce and 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 maybe bring about a new set of uh, of of um, questions before the leadership. Uh, in my view, the Communist Party has survived for so long, and this is what I had written in my piece that its ability to be able to respond and change itself. And I think uh, already we are seeing that when this great backlash against Wolf warrior happened. You could see that there was a bit of a backtracking. Uh, so the whether the whole world is going to react to this or whether there, but the fact is that China is not uh, likely to completely be oblivious uh, to what is going to, uh, to what's going to be generated as a as a kind of a uh, response to this assertiveness. Uh, so there are many questions here, and I think uh, it's it's. Uh, Clearly, uh, this is just the start of the next hundred years, if at all. But uh, there are enough enough issues for the Communist Party to start thinking about. Um, and Beam, uh, to you, uh, are very grateful. Uh, thanks for having organized this panel. It was really very refreshing, fascinating discussion. Lots of new ideas came in. Very good questions. Um, so thank you, Beam, and thank you, the Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. And thank you, panelists. Uh, fantastic presentations. Um, in the chat box, we have thanks being given out to all the panelists. Excellent presentations. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Beam for uh, the usual thanks, which we, which we don't want because we need to thank you. OK. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you all the panelists and the participants here. I just want to, uh, you know, just a uh, uh, lot of queries have come still, and the students are writing to me, and I'll definitely forward those questions to the panelists, and we'll, we'll look forward to your interventions. And I think definitely the talk has really, uh, you know, uh, charged them. I guess so. I think I'll, having said that, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Swan. Uh, uh, the HOD here in the department, yeah. And then Somia, uh, uh, assistant professor from EPU and the co-organizer before, like, uh, she will give us the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Professor yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Beam and uh, Professor Alka for having competently, you know, managed and uh, preside over the proceeding. And thank you once again to all the panelists for those very insightful uh, you know, presentations. Uh, I hope uh, the uh, participants of this panel discussion benefit greatly from the complex ideas uh, pr uh, presented and the thought-provoking, uh, you know, uh, ideas which uh, are uh, exchanged uh, in the Q&A as well as in the uh, panel discussion. So uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, all of you once again uh, and uh, the uh, faculty colleagues as well as uh, students and colleagues from other universities and colleagues for making this such a very fruitful uh, exchange of ideas. So over to you, Somia. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll be uh, giving the formal vote of thanks. Eminent speaker, present invited guests, teachers, colleagues and participants. A very good evening to all. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege both to propose a vote of thanks on this digital platform. I, on the department, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Professor Swan, the uh, head of the Department of Department of Political Science, Hyderabad University, for his constant support for organizing this event. I would also like to acknowledge my sincere gratitude to Professor Alka Acharya for accepting our invitation and consenting to chair this session. My heartfelt thanks goes to Professor Mahanti, Dr. Pathak, Dr. Devin, Dr. Adlakha, and Patricio, who spared time from their busy schedule to be a part of this panel discussion. My sincere thanks also goes to Dr. Bhim Subha for his immense effort, support, and cooperation. I must not forget to thank the participants Thank you all for showing interest in the program. Thank you once again. Bye bye, all. Yeah, thank you and have a very good evening. Uh, thank you. Have a very good day, Patricio. Yeah, nice to see you and thank hear you. you. Thank you, Patricio. Thank, thank you. you. Very pleased to share with thank you. you. Very pleased. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you, very bye. Much. Thank you, Samba. Thank you, Son. Have a good night. Yeah, Professor Mohanty, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you.